So hello and welcome to today's Commons Conversation in the Berkeley Center for New Media Commons, which is this space we are in right now. I'm Gail Tocosnik, I'm an Associate Professor in BCNM and in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. And it is an honor and a great pleasure to introduce the phenomenal Bo Ruber, uh, who is a Berkeley alum, who earned a PhD in Comparative Literature and a DE in New Media here. Uh, we're not supposed to have favorites, but Bo is one of my favorite students ever. A tremendous seminar participant, researcher, writer, organizer, and peer mentor as a graduate student, and it was no surprise when they received top tier postdoctoral fellowships and then a tenure track offer from UCI. So now, today, Bo is Assistant Professor of Digital Games and Interactive Media uh, in the Department of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. Their research explores gender and sexuality in digital media and digital cultures. Uh, they are the author of Video Games Have Always Been Queer, uh, published by NYU Press this year, and the co-editor of Queer Game Studies, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017. They're also the co-lead organizer and co-founder of the annual Queerness and Games Conference, QGCon, which they inaugurated while a grad student here. Uh, many of you know that I also co-lead a working group called The Color of New Media, and that group's first book is finally being published next month. <laughs> it's called uh, Hashtag Identity, and it's about Twitter and race, gender, sexuality, and nation. Uh, it's coming out from the University of Michigan Press next month, also open access. Um, and Bo has contributed a chapter to that book on hashtag no homo about um, the commonplace disavowal of queer feelings online on social media and what that can tell us about social media's facilitation of homophobia. Please join me in welcoming Bo River. So here's the plan for about 
you know, 45 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about these two things, queerness and games, what they mean together, um, and think about the place where they meet. I'll walk you through the core argument of the book, which is that all video games, even games that don't appear to have any LGBT representation, can be understood as queer. Um, I'll highlight three big ways that we can think about that, so through queer interpretation, through queer play, and through queer design. Um, and then I'll talk about some new directions I've been exploring, specifically kind of how queerness can be seen in the computational technologies that underlie video games, so the, the digital systems that games are built on. Um, I'm also going to be thinking about some actionable takeaways for design. Uh, it's, being interdisciplinary is always interesting because you never quite know who you're speaking to. So some of you folks may be thinking about designing your own games, your own technologies, maybe media studies scholars, so uh, give a little bit of everything. So let's think about these two things, video games and queerness. What do these mean, right? One of them seems kind of obvious, and one of them seems kind of like an enigma, um, but it's worth taking a moment to stop and break them both apart. Start with video games. So when we talk about video games, what are we talking about? Um, it seems like a silly question, but it's actually really not. For a lot of people, when they think about video games, what they think about is first-person shooters, games that are violent or include misogynistic representations of women. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are tons of games out there like that. But that's only a small piece of the picture of games. There are tons of different kinds of video games out there. There are narrative games, and historical games, and puzzle games, and casual games, right? And these kind of weird, funny, cute games. Um, these are just some of the most popular ones from 2018. But it's really crucial that we recognize all of those things as video games. Because otherwise, we reinforce this discriminatory idea about what is or isn't a real game. Otherwise, we end up with this idea that only games developed for an audience of hardcore, white, straight, cisgender, male gamer bros get to count as video games. Um, by the way, some further reading, if you're interested in thinking through the cultural politics of how we determine what does or doesn't count as a game, I really recommend Sheer Chess's book, Ready Player Two, which is about casual games, um, and Melissa Keegan's work on gender and walking simulation. So what about this word queerness, or queer? Some of you in the room may be queer studies folks and you know these things very well, and for other folks this may be a kind of new concept to work through. Here's the, the simple version, right? This is a word that means a lot of things to a lot of people, um, but we can primarily break it down into two meanings. So it can be an umbrella term for anyone in the LGBT spectrum, um, though not all LGBT folks identify as queer. And as an identity marker, it doesn't just mean the same thing as gay, right? It means something much broader than that. So gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender non-binary, asexual, intersex, this whole broad range. And what unites these folks in their identities is that they don't fit that status quo of sexuality and gender, which we think of as heteronormativity. Um, I like to have this in here just to explain a little bit, because for some folks, queer still kind of snags, right? Um, because it used to be a derogatory term, but it's been largely reclaimed, um, both by queer cultures and by queer theory. Today there are lots of folks who take pride in being queer. Um, this is the bumper sticker on the back of my car right now. Uh, I'm definitely one of those people who takes pride in being queer. So the second meaning of queerness is more complicated. It describes an ethos, or a way of being, that resists or rejects oppressive norms of sexuality and gender. And so something can be queer, or something can be done queerly, or something can be queer. This type of queerness is really notoriously hard to pin down with some kind of concrete definition. So here are just some ways that queer theorists have defined it. Um, Mel Chen says, queerness is the exceptions to the conventional ordering of sex, reproduction, and intimacy. Jose Munoz says, queerness is a rejection of here and now and an insistence on the possibility for another world. Jack Halberstam says, queerness is a basic desire to live life otherwise. And the second meaning of queerness, which isn't about individual identity, even though it's explored through queer theory and can sound kind of abstract, it actually comes out of the tradition of radical queer activism. So even when it seems conceptual, it's rooted in real queer lives, um, and it calls on us to challenge 
challenge the idea that straightness and cisgenderness are natural, normal categories that should be privileged by default. Okay, so these two things, queerness and video games, how do they relate to one another? Um, often I'm talking to people about my work and they're really surprised that these two things go together. Uh, and I think that's because they're used to imagining video games purely as being homophobic and exclusionary, and that it's absolutely correct that a lot of gamer culture is really toxic. Um, for LGBT folks, this kind of background radiation of harassment is a very present reality. Um, and if you're interested, there are lots of folks who've done great writing on this toxic gamer culture. Um, there's a book out recently called The Toxic Meritocracy of Video Games that I highly recommend for that. But there's a lot more at this intersection between queerness and video games than just exclusion, right? It's actually very vibrant and very rich. Um, it's not just about how queer people have been kept out of games, it's also about how queer people are creating space for themselves within games. Okay, so some of the things that we find at this intersection, if we start kind of pulling it apart, what do we see? We find LGBT representation in games. So the moments where queer people or queer romances uh, actually appear in games. And this comes up a lot around big mainstream games, so like the Mass Effect series, the Dragon Age games, um, or more recently Overwatch and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. <coughs> Slowly but surely we're seeing more of these LGBT characters in big games. We also find at this intersection uh, this movement that I call the Queer Games Avant-Garde, which is a growing network of folks who are making groundbreaking experimental games that are explicitly for and by and about queer people. Um, so you may have heard of some of these folks. They're people like Anna Anthropy or Robert Yang. Uh, there are actually dozens, at this point maybe hundreds, of people uh, making these small, interesting queer games. And then we also find these queer communities that have kind of grown up around gaming. So there are events like the Queerness in Games Conference, which started here at Berkeley, um, and it's been going for the last six years. Also Gamer X, which is a um, queer gaming convention. And then sort of adjacent intersectional events like different games and the Gay Dance of Color Expo. And then I would also point towards the existence of LGBT characters and creators in games in history. So often we find this assumption that there have not been any queer people in games until recently. And that's actually really not true. Um, so there are scholars like Adrienne Shaw or Lane Nooney who've done really important work to show that queer and trans folks have been appearing in games and making games for decades. Um, this is a poster for the Rainbow Arcade, which is an entire museum exhibit happening right now in Berlin. And it's entirely dedicated to the LGBT history, the queer history of video games. Um, if you find yourself in Berlin between now and May 13th, So there are all those things we could talk about, um, but there's also this big piece of the equation that isn't there yet, and this is where my work really comes in and where the book really comes in. And that's this idea that video games themselves can be queer. So games can resist dominant norms of sexuality and gender, Queerness in games can mean more than the representation of LGBT characters or same-sex romance. Queerness can also be expressed through how we design, play, or interpret games. So I keep coming back to this idea that this sounds kind of abstract, and then I think that's because when we think about queerness and queer theory, it's important to stay rooted in the real material realities of other people, right? So within the ecosystem of games culture, this is actually a pretty bold claim. Um, especially for those of us who've been, been made to feel really unwelcome in games for a really long time. Arguing for the ways that video games can be queer beyond representation, or more accurately, how they can uh, be queer if we redefine representation, is a way to lay claim to the medium of games itself. And so we're at this moment in games culture where people are becoming openly hostile towards diversity. So at that moment, arguing for the queer potential of video games is an act of reclamation. It's a way to say, you know, you know what? Queer people have always belonged in video games because video games have always been queer. Um, so let me show you what this idea of video games being queer looks like and tell you some of these key ways that we can find queerness in games beyond representation. So those three are through interpretation, play, and design. Let's start with interpretation. 
Okay. Queer interpretation is the process of using lenses informed by queer experience to look at video games in new ways. Queer interpretation is about reading between the lines, about getting up close to a game and seeing how it relates to issues of sexuality and gender. And so there's a ton of precedent for this, as I'm sure you know, in areas like literature and film, um, but it's still pretty new in game studies. Gamers often defend games as straight, by insisting that queer interpretation is just reading too much into something. Um, and I find that really interesting because that's actually the point, right? <laughs> that you're trying to dig beneath the surface of something. Um, queer interpretation isn't interested in the intentions of game developers. It's not interested in the right way to understand a game. It's about finding alternative meanings. So, I'm going to tell you about a game that I think demonstrates really nicely how queer interpretation can open up our understandings of games. Um, this is also a game that I really love, so if you see me grinning, this is just like one of my favorite games. Uh, this is Octodad. Has anyone played Octodad? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Octodad is an indie game. Um, it's from a studio called Young Horses, and it was released in 2014, but it's become kind of a cult classic, so it has an ongoing vanish afterlife. It's a game about playing as an octopus who's trying to pose as a human man. The tagline for the game is loving father, caring husband, secret octopus. Um, and that actually sums it up really nicely. So to progress, players have to complete these everyday daddy tasks, uh, things like mowing the lawn or flipping burgers, and they have to do it without arousing suspicion. So Octodad is trying to convince those around him, and especially his family, that he's a normal suburban dad. That's a lot harder than it sounds, though. Um, and it's not just because he totally looks like an octopus in a suit. Nobody seems to notice that. Um, what makes it really challenging is the controls. So each of Octodad's tentacles, which can stand in for his arms and his legs, are controlled individually and mapped onto different buttons on the game controller or keyboard. And you're seeing that here, this is the tutorial for the game, um, and this is the Xbox version, so you can see how his different arms are mapped to different buttons. Octodad is intentionally awkward and hard to control. So the meaning in this game doesn't just lie in what we see on screen, it also lies in what it feels like to play. <laughs> In most video games, moving forward is so simple that we barely even think about it. By contrast, in Octodad, basic actions like walking or picking up objects or trying to buy some produce from the supermarket become these feats of flailing contortion. In part, Octodad's queerness lies in the way that it embraces this embodied strangeness. The game denaturalizes the idea of a natural body, highlighting the performativity of normalcy. It also calls to mind the experiences of folks with disabilities who must move through physical and social terrain that is designed for other sorts of bodies. So let's see what this looks like in action. I'm going to show you a short video. Um, so this is the opening scene of the game, uh, and this is actually Octodad's way. So he's about to walk down the aisle.
hard to play this game. If anyone picks it up, it's actually really challenging. So that moment where he keeps whacking her with the ring, it's not that like the player's trying to be weird about that. It's actually just really hard to play the ring. <laughs> But if we use our queer interpreted lens, it really quickly opens itself up to being a game about gender, sexuality, and identity. Octodad wants to be a loving father and a caring husband. So in one of these scenes, he's trying to take his wife out on a romantic date. Uh, there's another scene where he's trying to convince his son he's really good at basketball. <laughs> Each of these objectives relates to performing straight masculinity. Octodad is a game about passing. To pass is to succeed in being seen in a certain way, as straight, or as cisgender, or as white. Um, but often God wants to pass as human. So when we approach this game queerly, what we see is that Octodad's octopusness becomes a metaphor. It stands in for all those things about ourselves that we feel like we have to hide in order to be seen as acceptable in mainstream society. Even when those things are so core to ourself that pretending to be otherwise is absurd. Let's talk about this second way of finding queerness in game. So this is through play. Um, so just like any game can be interpreted queerly, any game can be played queerly. Playing a game queerly means playing in ways that resist normative expectations. Um, so sometimes queer play can be built into a game, but more often it's emergent. Queer play often looks like playing the wrong way. It's about following alternative logics of desire. Um, and so what I mean by that is playing in ways that you find the thing that you want from something. You find the reason that you're doing it, not the way that's built in. So queer play might look like playing to lose rather than playing to win. Uh, for example, by playing a racing game and instead of trying to win, focusing on uh, crashing your car. It might look like playing with no intention of having fun. <laughs> Like by playing a game that you know is bad. Um, for example, this is the 1982 E.T. game uh, from Atari, which is notoriously considered the worst game of all time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the phenomenon that I want to kind of pull apart here, one that I find particularly interesting through this idea of queer play, is speedrunning. So speedrunning is playing a video game as fast as possible. Uh, and to do this, speedrunners use a detailed knowledge of games and their glitches to move through these spaces far more quickly than game developers intended. Um, often speedrunners are running for a live audience, so that's what you're seeing here. Um, there are folks speedrunning and it's being streamed live. So let's see what speedrunning looks like in action. Um, this is a video from the most recent Games Done Quick, which is um, a speedrunning event that collects money for charity. This speedrunner is doing what's called an any percent glitched run, so there are lots of different kinds of run, um, and that means that she's trying to get to the end as fast as possible, and um, she can use glitches along the way. She knows exactly where to stand to um, trigger that glitch. She's also optimizing these other ways. 
legs. You can see as she's moving forward, she's jumping because that's faster than running. Um, this is kind of a practice of contradiction, speed running in general. And it's competitive, but it's also collaborative. The community kind of builds a shared understanding of where these glitches are. Um, it's about following precise instructions, right? Standing in the exact right pixel for something to happen, but it's also creative. It's about playing a game faster than anybody has ever played it, um, but it takes an enormous amount of time to get it right. To practice this takes such a huge amount of time. Um, it's also really complicated in terms of culture. So in some ways, speedrunning is more inclusive than other similarly competitive gaming communities. Um, so for example, there are many more transgender women who are well known in uh, the speedrunning community than in something like esports, and uh, Narcissism Right is an example of that. But these same women have often been the objects of harassment from within speedrunning communities. What makes speedrunning arguably a queer play practice is its non-normative relationship to time. So time is a recurring topic in queer theory. Um, lots of queer theorists, Jack Halberstam, Heather Love, Elizabeth Freeman, have all written about queer time. And the basic idea is that our concepts of temporality are social constructs, and that there's a close relationship between time and heteronormativity. Uh, so Freeman calls this chrononormativity, which is the idea that we're supposed to live according to what she calls a coordinated, carefully syncopated tempo of life events. And that many of those are tied to gender and sexuality. So if we think about things like getting married and having kids. The medium of video games has its own chrononormativity. Jump back here for a sec. The medium of video games has its own chrononormativity. So standards for things like how long a certain type of game is supposed to take, or how quickly we're supposed to move through it. So if we think about it in the context of video games, chrononormativity names a sort of set of foundational logics that have come to shape how games are designed and experienced in relation to time. Speedrunning rejects that chrononormativity. Speedrunners speed through areas where they're meant to be cautious or to explore. Um, so like you see in the video, right, she's hopping using glitches through these areas that have been designed for her to have to navigate more slowly. Speedrunners set their own terms for what it means to play a video game and reject the coordinated, carefully syncopated tempo of standard gameplay. But I think it's also worth thinking about speedrunning as queer, trying to complicate that a little bit, right? Because this example highlights some of the tensions around this idea of queer play. Um, speedrunners don't talk about themselves as queer. And if we look back at the scene that I started with, um, is this really the picture of queerness that we want? There's a little bit of racial diversity in here, but the reality is that the vast majority of the speedrunning community is still made up of straight, white men and boys. So it raises these questions, like what does it mean to think about play as transformative if the players in question are themselves normative? What does it mean to look for queer potential in games that have been designed with hegemonic intentions? And the answer is that play can be both of these things at once, right? Games can be both of these things at once. They can be both normative and transformative. The relationship between those two things is fundamentally <coughs> messy. And that's part of the value of studying play in this way, of finding queer meaning in play, is that it doesn't make things simpler, right? Looking through video, looking at video games through this lens of queerness, it's not a way to make them clearer. It's not even a way to necessarily make them better. What it does is invite us to seek out and to value friction and complexity, both in terms of what we play and how we play it. So let's think about this third piece, queer design. So queer game design is the practice of using game mechanics and other design elements, uh, so the actual kind of interactive components of video games to challenge normative expectations around gender and sexuality. And sometimes queer design can be unintentional, but I'm gonna focus here on games that are intentionally designed in ways that are queer. Uh, many of the best examples of this come from that network I was telling you about in the queer games avant-garde. 
um, these contemporary queer indie game makers. Someone who's really led the way on this is Avery Alder with her game Monster Hearts. Um, and what's amazing about this work is that Alder is a tabletop role-playing designer. Um, and she thinks about how these fundamental elements of gameplay, so it's something even like rolling a dice, can be used to express queer desire. But this is the game I want to show you to exemplify this, um, this kind of queer design. So this is Realistic Kissing Simulator. It was made by Jimmy Andrews and Lauren Schmidt, and it was released in 2014. And here's how it works. So it's a two-player game. Both players stand side by side at the same keyboard, so they each control two keys that they have to kind of press close together to play. And they're represented by these two faces, right? One purple, one kind of bluish greenish, and they're ambiguous both in terms of gender and in terms of race. Um, the game is also really big on consent, so two players have to agree to kiss before they can start, and they can stop kissing at any point. <laughs> control these like long floppy tongues. They can poke each other in the eye, or they can kind of lick each other's noses, or they can wriggle into each other's mouths. Uh, Anders and Schmidt intentionally designed this game to be goalless. That's the word they use, goalless. There are no instructions about what players should be trying to accomplish. There's no way to win or lose. Realistic Kissing Simulator can be played for just a moment, or it can be played indefinitely. So let me show you what this game looks like. And you have to imagine two people coming and playing, pressed up together. I really, I'm into the awkwardness of these games, and when I use this in the classroom, where I show it um, at indie festivals, I like to call two strangers to the front and just see like what this is like in the first time encounter. Apparently the game is relatable for a lot of people though. 
People often tell me that the game reminds them of learning how to kiss for the first time. These awkward attempts at figuring out how to move your parts to <coughs> What I really appreciate about this quote is how it captures the way that the interactive elements of a game can be shaped by queer and trans experience. And I also really love this idea that even though realistic kissing simulator seems totally unrealistic, right? It seems like that's the joke. Um, it actually captures something real. Right? This feeling that there's something queer in the act of kissing itself, whether or not it's done by a queer person. So games like the Mystic Kissing Simulator are specifically designed to play around with gender and sexuality. They use the interactive nature of video games to encourage us to imagine our experiences as bodies differently. So those are the three main ways that the book approaches this, but since writing it, I've been expanding these ideas into some new areas. Um, and in particular, I'm really interested in how we can find queerness by looking at these underlying computational systems on which video games are built. And so the very technologies that underlie games. Over the last few years in digital media studies, there's been this growing interest in looking at code and looking at platforms. And I think that's super valuable. But when we talk about video games, we really need to be thinking more about development engines. Uh, development engines are things like Unreal, or Unity, or Game Maker, uh, or even Twine, or Emotica. Uh, if you don't know Emotica, it's an entire game engine uh, dedicated to making games out of emojis. Uh, it's super fun and really easy to use, I recommend it. And these are the toolkits that developers use to build games. So these toolkits actively shape what games look like and what they can do. In particular, I'm really interested in physics engines. Uh, which are a key component of many, many of these development engines. Um, what a physics engine does is it determines how bodies and objects move in video games. So how they're affected by gravity, um, how they interact with one another when they touch. It's all these things that make gameplay feel tangible. Game physics are part of almost all video games these days, um, but they're easiest to see in what are generally called physics games. So that's a whole genre that explicitly focuses on playing with physics systems. There are tons of these games out there. Some of the most popular, like um, Angry Birds, which is still one of the most popular games on the planet, is a physics game. This is my personal favorite, which is Hacky Cat, which is just all about kicking cats, <laughs> keeping them in the air for as long as possible. Usually, in the context of games culture or the games industry, when we talk about physics engines, we talk about them in terms of how realistic they are. Um, so these kind of discourses of realism, which also come up against ideas of queerness. Uh, so we think about how advanced or complex they are as computational tools. And that makes physics systems sound like they're entirely technical, like they're not affected by or reflective of things like society or identity. Um, and that's totally not true. Game physics as we know them today are actually really closely tied to gender and sexuality. Um, and that's in part because of this specific kind of game physics that's been like a behind the scenes driver of technical advancement in this area for decades. And that's breast physics. So breast physics are the way that uh, games simulate the gravity and bounce of women's bodies. Since the 1990s, video game developers have been striving to create better breast physics. I don't know if anyone else is as old as I am and was in games in the 90s when like new things would come out and all the gamer reviews would be like, best breast physics out there. Um, totally a thing. So it's these innovations in breast physics that have uh, led to innovations in physics engines more broadly. Um, and an interesting historical note, what I'm finding in my research is that uh, it's really fighting games, like Street Fighter or Dead or Alive, that have been instrumental in the rise of breast physics as kind of shadow technology. So this history makes game physics seem really straight, right? But I think there's also a lot of queer potential in game physics. So the question is, how do we take this tool set that's grown up out of a very heteronormative and arguably sexist history and how do we rethink it in order to find its non-normative or even subversive implications? Um, I'm not the only one thinking about queerness and game physics, and so I work in an area that's broadly called queer game studies. 
And there are a bunch of folks thinking about this right now. Uh, folks like Amanda Phillips and Ariana Gass have been doing really great work on Grinnis and Ragdoll physics. Um, so Ragdoll physics are the physics that allow bodies to kind of flop in games. And there are even some physics games these days that are explicitly making this connection between Ragdoll physics and queerness. Um, so for example, genital jousting. This is maybe the tamest image anyone can take from genital jousting. <laughs> 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 they, they very specifically cut it off right here so the testicles fall below them. <laughs> um, for me, as somebody who's often thinking in non-traditional ways or non-literal ways about representation, what I'm really fascinated by is the relationship between queerness and physics in a different place, in a place you might not expect. And that's physics games that are about playing with or playing as food. Um, so I'm really interested in particular in these two games. I am bread and nor. Nor is about using game physics to do absurdist things to food. So like you can turn on this faucet and just shower ice cream endlessly with sprinkles. <laughs> um, and I am bread is a little bit more traditionally game-like. You play as a piece of bread that's trying to fling itself from one side of a kitchen in, uh, from one side to another in the kitchen in order to get itself into the toaster, to slot itself into the toaster and toast itself. So I'll show you one last clip so you can see what I am bread looks like. Um, and again, like with Octodad, this is actually quite hard to play. Um, the fact that this person makes so much progress, they're actually like super good at I am bread. Uh, and it's again about control. It's again about mapping control. So um, each of the corners of the piece of bread are mapped to a different button on the controller. So you have to coordinate to fling your toast body across the Tradition in queer art and culture of comedy and camp. 
A lot of times when we talk about creating media that reflects the experiences of marginalized folks, we think we have to tell stories that are about pain and loss. But there's more to being a queer person than suffering. So if you are someone out there who's interested in making games, designing your own games, something to take away from this is that thinking about video games as queer shows us that all games have meaning. You don't have to make something like a quote unquote serious game to make something that is seriously meaningful. What's often important to folks who are different is that you demonstrate that you're thinking differently. That you're not just replicating the status quo, but you're being thoughtful about how you engage with that status quo. So when you think back to this, and it starts to feel abstract, like this idea of queerness and how it relates to games, I just want to remind you that there are a lot of people for whom this act of reclaiming games means a great deal. Um, in addition to being a scholar, as Gail mentioned, I also am a queer community organizer. Um, so for the last six years, I've helped run this event, the Queerness and Games Conference. And it brings together hundreds of queer folks from across, from across the world, really, every year. So for people like this, the stakes of insisting that queerness has a place in video games are very real and very present. This work is about critical thinking. But it's also about laying the groundwork so that living, breathing LGBT people can exist safely and joyfully in video games. And I'm one of those people too, right? The stakes are personal for me too. I'm a queer person, I'm a person who loves video games. So when I argue for a queer understanding of games, I'm also arguing for my own right, as well as the right of other people like me to exist in this medium that I love. That's where I'll wrap up. I also have cool buttons that I made from the cover art. If you want some, come say hi. Thanks very much. So thanks for listening. I think we still have a bunch of time for questions and conversation. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about. I, I just wanted to say it was such a great presentation and oh, really, um, uh, really delightful and, and so pc and any reflecting your own. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my own uh, interest in the history of games is actually pushes like of, of games on computers way back to the first days of the uh, the Sage console and development of computing to begin with, and yeah. Space War as a and, and computers as themselves a kind of um, very deliberate like querying of what of games is a, is a query yeah. of what computers are supposed, computers to do, supposed to do, yeah. just you know, to begin with these sort yeah. of uh, uh, fundamentally like objects that are fundamentally about usefulness and about optimization, and yeah. the games really being about neither. And I, I'm sure you've thought a lot about this, but I, I would be very interested in hearing you expand a little bit more on that more uh, kind of larger history and, and context for games as something that we do want computers to help. Yeah, so I think that I think it's really complicated, right? Let yeah. me give you an anecdote. So I was at the Smithsonian in the fall because they're trying to put together a big games exhibit. So they were trying to figure out how to do that thoughtfully. And it happened to be the anniversary of Space Force. Um, so they gathered all of these like 80 year old white men who yeah. have worked on the original Space Force and it's a tribute to them. Um, and on the one hand, that was about playfulness, like what you're saying, taking yeah. a computer that's meant to be a, a useful item, doing something fun. Yeah. Like they got together in college, they tinkered, they made this game that's now the grandfather of video games. But it's also fundamentally tied to technological innovation more broadly, and also to war, yeah. right? Um, because the machine that they were working on was, at, they had access to it, college access to it, because it was meant for like developing military technologies, and especially flight simulation. And physics is one of the things that they brought up in this yeah. conversation. And they were saying, oh, the, the thing that we really made possible with this game is great simulation physics for flying in space, so that it could then be brought back into a military context and used for future simulation. So I, on the one hand, I want to believe this thing, right? That yeah. the games are about clearing the capitalistic instrumentalization of technology. Right. But gosh, if you don't do it thoughtfully, then it just feeds right back into those same systems. Right. Um, I was wondering what sort of your thoughts about like uh, 
for like amateur run like things like a uh, Yuri Game Jam that runs every year where just like two months of like trying to invite as many amateur and game makers to like produce all this queer content. Yeah. Just wondering like what your thoughts on that are in terms of like leveling the playing field or Yeah, can I turn it back to you for a sec? So have sure. you participated in that? Uh no I have not personally participated in Yuri Game Jam, but I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean I like I like game jams. I like people just picking stuff up and making weird things. So I used to teach game design, um, and I love that spirit of like, we're not going to spend a year or five years making something. We're just going to like pick up the tools at our disposal and make things. And I think it lends itself to things that are more raw and more radical and more like tied to affect and feeling. Um, there's a little bit of a narrative around accessibility of game making that's worth questioning. Like with tools like Unity, for example, you hear folks say. Oh, everyone can make a game now because Unity is so accessible. Has anyone tried to make a game with Unity? Yeah, okay, you can learn Unity. But it's not like you can have no coding experience, wake up one morning and make a Unity game, right? You need resources, you need education, it's about access. It's, it's all about all these things. So in, I think in general that's awesome. I think platforms like Itch, if you don't know, itch.io is great for distributing that stuff. It's a far less like um, exploitative distribution model. I think it's great. I think everyone should make more queer games while like remaining critical of the things that are limits there. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for this amazing talk. Oh, that's right. Um, I'm curious, and I'm not a gamer at all, but I've kind of gotten a sense that in terms of like evaluating skill and technical excellence, it's something yeah. that men and boys who play a certain kind of game kind of want a monopoly over. And so if you're like a woman or someone else who plays games, you kind of have to like prove your skill. Or um, like do a lot of harassment in that space. So I'm wondering if you could speak to like how, like what it means to be good at a game like Octodad or Iron yeah. Man, like, where that kind of excellence is shown. Like if you could stream those things and just like how that might change the landscape of like how excellence is defined. That's such a good question. So you're absolutely right that the how good you are at a game is fundamentally tied to gender issues race issues and this idea of um, who gets to be a legitimate gamer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that rhetoric is like you're not a real gamer unless you're really good at games. And it's coming up more and more like esports is a place that just ramps this up. Um, but being good at a game that's, it's hard, but it's hard in this like silly, strange way. I'm sure there's someone out there who's on the internet streaming being like, being super butch about being really good at Octodad. <laughs> but I haven't encountered that. And I think that's one of the things that I like about this space is like it's just strange enough and intentionally awkward enough that it seems to kind of sidestep that, this idea of a toxic meritocracy, the idea that you have to be super good. Um, and then there are games where people are intentionally bad at and that can be problematic too. So that what I was talking about at SCMS is um, Robert Yang's games. So he makes these explicitly gay sex games. Um, and people go on YouTube and they stream themselves being bad at them. Because that's their own way of performing a kind of gamer masculinity to say, I picked up, they often pretend like they, they didn't even know what it was. Like, they picked it up, oh god, I'm like washing a man. Who even knew? But like, that's totally the premise of the game. They don't even knew that. Um, and then they will like get on their stream and be like, I'm so bad at it. I don't even know how to do this. And it's a kind of funny inversion of that meritocracy. Um, so, some, some background information. Um, I'm reading this book called Evolution's Rainbow. I don't know that. It's a book about gender and sexuality in the animal kingdom. So I'm a PhD candidate in biology. And the author, John Lundgarden, defines gender identity as a cognitive lens. Mm -hmm. And so what I really like about these games, like Octodad is it, and the, the, is it just called Bread? I am, um, I am Bread. bread. Yeah. <laughs> It kind of shuffles that for you so that you're forced to have a different cognitive lens where you don't, you can't assign meaning to your settings mm -hmm. because you don't have like your identity that you're used to. Yeah. Um, so it's, I feel like this also leads to things in feminist theory with Judith Butler and I was wondering, do you think that games are taking other parts of theory from feminist theory or other literature in terms of inspiration for these games? Or yeah. Is there intersectionality or is that just like coincidence? Nothing is ever coincidence. <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right that there's something really interesting in like why have an octopus? Why 
why have a slice of bread? Why have these like faces that are in some ways nearly unrecognizable as realistic faces? Because it, it denaturalizes, right? It pulls you away from your assumptions and make, makes your assumptions strange. Yeah. I think the connection to animal studies is perfect too. Ed Mel Chen, who's here at Berkeley, does work on animal scenes. So the idea, the kind of intersection of thinking about queerness through how we animate bodies or non-human bodies. Um, I think that's totally here too. Um, I don't think that people who made like Octodad and I Am Bread are reading Judith Butler and doing it intentionally. But in this other area, this uh, kind of queer indie games area, like Realistic Kissing Simulator, I think they absolutely are. Um, I think they're absolutely folks who are reading queer theory, reading feminist theory. There's a whole branch of this kind of work that's based on um, feminist performance art histories. Um, and so trying to draw from that idea of like vulnerability of the body and presence of the body in lived spaces to make games that are like hybrid installation feminist games. So there's a lot of it out there. But I don't know that they're, yeah. But they're, I don't think it's intentional for those particular games. I really enjoy your presentation. Oh, thank you. Hey. Hey. Um, I can just figure out how to, to lay this clearly. So the interesting thing about the sort of queer avant-garde that you yeah. described is um, sort of that it, it sort of formalizes the sort of aesthetic practices that are like, yeah, avant-garde meaning forerunner, right? like yeah. the, the, the kinds of form that challenge what we think of as video game form. And in the history of the novel, we also know that there is this sort of the, the group of formal, for, uh, the high modernists are sort of like formally queer. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the question that I've been having about the sort of queer games movement in general, which we may be referring to, is that what is it about queerness, I suppose, that sort of it lends itself to a, a unique formalism? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the kind of oversimplified answer is that it's about questioning norms, right? And that the norms of an artistic medium and the norms of a technological form are always fundamentally tied to gender and sexuality. So when we start to question the gender and sexuality aspects of things, we also come to question form, right? right? Or when we're self-aware of those things, then we start to break them down together. Um, Avant-gardeness is such a hard thing, right? I struggle with this when I talk about this as a network of, of avant-garde, mm -hmm. because then it Historically, avant-garde have themselves been, in some ways, largely straight, and in some ways, largely male, right? or at least the figures who we remember from them. Right. Um, so surrealism, for example, as an avant-garde, is very playful, very tied to games, but also very misogynistic, very homophobic. Um, so there's something about queerness that lends itself to experimentation mm -hmm. and different forms of thinking, but then it also gets subsumed back into larger power structures. Right. So is there a way in which maybe the, the queer uh, kind of like being able to identify queer formalism helps us maybe just see in like a magnified way the kind of formal aesthetics that are otherwise already there? Yeah, I think there's definitely some of that where it makes those things visible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good example of that. I mean, there's a little bit of that in Realistic Kissing Simulator, right? Where like, kind of heightens the idea that like kissing could be playable, or like sex or intimacy could be playable is part of its absurdity, right. that it plays those things up. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get, what do you think? I feel like there's something here on your mind. <laughs> there is, I suppose it's, well, I was, okay, so qualifying, why I'm asking this is because I'm working on my qualifying exam, so yeah. I kind of lay out why uh, video games are sort of necessary to rethink like the way we talk about the novel. And it's yeah. not about narrative, right? It's not about the sort of narrative yes. or sort of mimetic or representational quality, but that a video game formalism helps us rethink the sort of stakes off like experimental fiction yeah. off uh, formalism. So the, so the novels that I'm looking at are not queer novels. Yeah. So the video games that I'm looking at are queer games. Yeah. So like what can I, should I do this? This is part of my concern. <laughs> <laughs> Not to workshop this question. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Everybody studying for games, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like I feel like you're stumping me a little bit. Is it something to like 
think through, right? Like how how what it means to take queer work and use it to bring back to these other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some ways on the ground, there's just there's this whole generation of folks who want to make games, who are queer and trans, who felt pushed out of other ways to make games, other communities, the games industry. So I think it's like not only is queerness a way that drives us to experiment, it's also a kind of necessity of the like cultural ecology that we're seeing, right? That if you want to be openly trans, visibly trans, maybe you don't want to be someone who passes, you want to make games. Like being indie is in some ways the only way to do it and like live your life. And so there's something, there's like a driving force there that's not just conceptual, it's also about like being a queer body and making work like that. Thanks for this talk. I'm going to teach you a book. Oh, so. <laughs> that's great. great. <laughs> and I was wondering while I was looking at your examples and particularly the last sort of more how to play in you know, queer yeah. games, right? That uh, touches a lot in community and different. But well, anyways, I was I was thinking of this sort of international and the scope, the global scope of this, and how you know a lot of these games kind of escape certain uh, I don't know cultural traditions of way to think. But on the other hand, they're all very very sort of Anglo-Western games yeah. and. And so I was thinking if you could talk a little bit about sort of other other cultures dealing with this queerness, what examples could you look at, other languages, and kind of like that and how they think they Yeah, totally. So there's well, uh, another aspect that also make this or I think Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. That's a great question. So um, the general landscape of game making is really regionality is complicated, nationality is complicated. So there tends to be there's game making centralized within North America, within Japan, and within parts of Europe. And that's not to say that's the only places where games are made, but that's where the largest games industry presence is. And then there are other folks doing indie work in South America, in Eastern Europe, things like that. But game studies, I think, is only starting to really like raise up and pay attention to those areas as well. So part of it is that the history of this discipline has been very North American. There are definitely queer indie folks making games in these other places. Mm -hmm. So in the UK, there's a really wonderful Irish um, indie game developer named uh, Lara McGee. She was my dream field. And so her games are in part about her experience being living in Scotland, living in Ireland, what it means to live in rural Ireland as a trans person and make these games. Um, but even then, nationality is complicated because the games that have inspired her to do that work mm -hmm. are games from North America or games from Japan. And then that's the, the language of games she's pulling from to make her own commentary to come from those different national traditions. Yeah. So uh, to an extent it's international, or to an extent this media is dispersing, yeah. but you can't remove it from your own like, lived national context too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's more work to do to explore that. Yeah. I would also um, say that there's a way that social media is yeah. is gamed, is is ga gamifies a lot of experiences. Mm -hmm. So you can have almost any kind of social encounter and transform it into a game and social media and you know different cultural objects from a lot of places will sort of get taken up and, and made a game that way. Um, so I think there are there are a lot of opportunities to look at different kinds of games being played today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
also now that there's AR and VR, there's I'm curious about like if you thought about the dangers or the potentials in these mediums. Yeah. Are there new kind of opportunities for queer expression through VR, but also potential downsides? Yeah, to it? like what could be the potential pitfalls, or as yeah. you've seen it kind of emerge, what are the tendencies it's heading towards? Yeah, totally. So I think um, there are two pieces of it. Um, one is there's a kind of mainstream discourse and industry discourse around using VR to facilitate empathetic experiences towards queer folks, but also other marginalized folks. So you see people making games or interactive experiences where their explicit goal is you will put on a headset and you will feel what somebody else feels, right? You'll feel what it's like to be queer, you'll feel often there are things like, you'll feel what it's like to be in a refugee camp, okay? Those things are often well-intentioned, but I think it's really problematic, the idea that that experience could be a meaningful way of stepping into someone's shoes, and also just it's, it's a kind of colonialist, appropriationist discourse to say, I'm going to step into someone's body and have their experience. On the other side, though, there are, there's a kind of group of artists, and as, again, the experimentation is led by queer artists, um, who are trying to do like, weird VR. And the idea is that um, VR is still mold, right? It's still relatively new. We don't have the same codified expectations around what it looks like to play or interact as we do in games, which are commercial games right at this point are like four and a half decades old. Um, and the idea is if we get in now and make VR weird, then we can, like queerness, that experimentation can be at the, the like foreground, can really be baked into how we understand those technologies. So um, Robert Yang is again somebody who's been doing this. I, there's an artist I love to death named Sean Musgrave, uh, and she has this installation piece, again, inspired by the history of feminist performance art, where so you go into a game space, like a game festival, um, you lay down, in terms of embodiment, most VR, you stand up, you move around, you hold a gun, this is, you lay down on a soft surface. What you see inside the VR headset is uh, like swaying palm trees and a blue sky, uh, and then you see kittens approach you. And what's happening is that Shauna has these mittens on that map, there's a camera they map to, so that they map to the kittens in VR. And what you feel is kittens hitting your face. <laughs> and it's her in the gallery space with spectators coming and petting you with mittens. Um, I just love them. I love them. <laughs> but I think what's fascinating, like embodiment is part of that, right? Like you are the body in virtual space, but you are still very, it's very insistent on the real body as well, right? And by making it a site of spectatorship and this intimacy, I think, is fascinating that like it's her. It's her directly like caressing you, right? But you see something different from within the virtual space. So, yeah, I think there's a potential for like a real queer play there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yes. Okay. Hi, great talk. This question is super scatterbrained, so I'm just gonna let that words out. But that's okay. Yeah. So uh, I think like a key word that games discourse and queer group discourse always shares is violence, right? Yeah. And when I think about the sort of like to, like what queer play looks like in practice of games, it often looks like making non-violent or making less violent yeah. games that include violence. Right? So something that I think of mm. as checking out is like, for example, playing an RPG and instead of fighting goblins, you just fish for lobsters the whole time. Yeah. Right? And I think like that's like a sort of instance of queer play in like practice, right? But then I also think that there I like I like what you said earlier about like we don't know that queer play is inherently liberatory. Right. For example, like there are ways such as is playing that game. Yeah. And I feel like some example that really came to me is like there's this whole industry now around sims and doing things wrong when playing sims. So for example, putting your sim in the pool and then taking out the ladder. Or just like there's a long standing tradition of messing with sims. Right. <laughs>
what does that mean, right? Is it queer plan that you're planning against the intended system? And you might be able to say, well, if SINs allows you to do those things, uh, like maybe that is part of the design. But like, I take your point, right? Mm -hmm. And the violence really heightens the stakes of that. Um, yeah, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> do you, because like, I think I get stuck on this thing, right? Like, you want to be optimistic, right? And be like, queer play is a way to like, reclaim this medium and make it ours, and I think that's true, right? But there still has to be room for that sort of harrowing approach of staying in the trouble, mm -hmm. um, and just sitting with that as a possibility, as a possibility for violence. Right. Yeah, and I feel like asking the question, like, how do we ensure queer play is always the rhetoric sort of defeats right. the purpose yeah. of queer play, right? Like, yeah. if we don't sort of, like, on one hand, we want to, like, shut out the possibility of So if you were to make a head family in The Sims and then like set them on fire, like I think as a queer person, I think there's an argument there that that is a kind of radical violence mm -hmm. that ha that has political potential, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are other queer games that are about violence. There's a game that uh, is called Gender Wrapped, which is about the post-apocalypse and kind of the idea that in order to live queer lives as like trans bodies, non-normative bodies, the world has to end first. Like this thing called society has to. So I think there's space for queer violence, but that's complicated too. I mean, queer, I mean, there's the sins is, <laughs> <laughs> the sins is a weird, I think, example too, because I think nowadays very few people play the sins in the intended way, yeah. right? So I feel like all of, like, talk about the sins is, like, things like, right, doing things like setting house on fire, or, like, specifically looking for and taking screenshots of, like, glitches, like, yeah. hunting for glitches in the sins is, like, a really big Yeah, it's almost like as that world becomes more robust and more open, mm -hmm. it moves further and further away from the design intention. Right. But then maybe the design intention becomes itself like a kind of weaker component, and it's more about the open playgroundness of it. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a really good question. Now I'm gonna.